Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly Bible study. We are going to be in the 42nd chapter of Jeremiah this week. We are going to have one more lesson in Jeremiah than we conclude our study of Jeremiah. We left off in chapter at the end of chapter 36 last week, and there are some things in between these that I think we need to plug in uh, in order to get a proper perspective on this week's study. So we're going to have a very quick prayer because I think we're going to have to speed teach today. A uh, quick prayer and uh, get this started. Heavenly Father, again, I always thank you for your word. I thank you for the lessons that were taught through your word. So Father, this week, open your word, open our hearts, open our minds, pour into us what you would have us to learn. Lord, help us to see your faithfulness, regardless of whether it's faithfulness to bless us or faithfulness, Father, to discipline us. Just help us to see your will in your ways. Forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So um, I'm going to start with chapter 37 and just kind of do a quick run through the things that... Um, I want you to know for today. We are back with King Zedekiah. We had skipped back to King Jehoiakim, uh, and but now we're back with King Zedekiah, who was the last king. He had an 11-year reign. Uh, he's the last king. The temple will be destroyed. Jerusalem will be destroyed. The city will be burned under his reign. Uh, king Zedekiah had been placed on the throne by Nebuchadnezzar. He was basically kind of a vassal king for most of the time. Uh, he ruled for 11 years, but his body was thrown out into the streets. He did not rest with his forefathers. We covered all of that last week. And that blood curse was on him for being so disobedient and so wicked. And he, um, the Lord through Jeremiah told him that his seed, his his offspring would not be on the throne. So when he did die um, and his body was thrown out into the streets, his son did come to the throne for three months, but then he was taken to captivity to uh, Babylon. And his brother, Jehoiakim's brother, was actually the one that was put on the throne by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So, uh, which was King Zedekiah, and that's where we are today. So, Zedekiah paid no attention to God. He made no attention to Jeremiah's prophecies and to what Jeremiah was saying. But Babylon was on their doorsteps, had been, and ba we've already had a couple of waves of, of uh, captives taken, and so Babylon's on the doorstep. And so, Zedekiah sent for Jeremiah and asked him to pray for Judah. And Jeremiah told Zedekiah, he said, the word from the Lord is the same. Go ahead and surrender to Babylon. You, um, you will, it'll be better for you. You're, don't be fooled. Egypt is going to come up against Babylon from the rear and Babylon will retreat and pull away from Jerusalem for a while, but don't let that fool you. They will be back with force and it will not be good for Israel. I mean, for Judah and for Jerusalem. Jeremiah was going to leave Jerusalem. Remember a few weeks ago, we talked about him buying a parcel of land that he was uh, the redeemer for. And so he is going to leave Jerusalem and go get, you know, claim this land, check on this land. He's leaving Jerusalem. He's arrested. He's accused of being a deserter, that he was going to go over to the Babylonians. And so they put him... Uh, in prison, in the courts of the of the palace, and it just says that he was there for a long time. This is, I think, more like house arrest. And then, of course, he keeps preaching the same message. And then one day, Zedekiah sent for him and asked him uh, if there was any word from the Lord. And he said, yes, there's word from the Lord all the time. It's the same message. You and Jerusalem are going to be destroyed if you don't surrender to Babylon. And so he um, he asked Zedekiah at that point to please not put him back in the dungeon. Um, actually, he had been put in a dungeon, not the the courts of the, of the palace at that time. He had been put in a dungeon. And he asked Zedekiah not to put him back in the dungeon. And Zedekiah did not 
um, and he was given bread, but the famine w was getting very bad. It said he was given bread until it ran out. And then in chapter 38, Jeremiah is still preaching that it's better to surrender to Babylon. It will save your lives. It will save the city, save the temple. But some of the officials go to the king and say, we just can't have Jeremiah preaching this. It's discouraging the soldiers and the people. And so the king says, do with them whatever you want to. So this time they put him down in a cistern. There's no water in the cistern. It's just miry mud down in the bottom. And it says that he, that he sank in it. And um, so he, I, we don't know how long he was left there, but he was basically just left there to die. And then another official named Ebed Melech, uh, he was just another one of the officials, goes to the king and he, he tells the king what an evil and wicked thing that they have done to Jeremiah. And so uh, the king tells him, King Zedekiah tells him to take 30 men with him and to get Jeremiah out of the cistern. So they rescued him, and at that point, he was kept in the court of the guard, which was also there in the, the palace grounds. So Zedekiah sends for Jeremiah again, and he says, tell me the truth, Jeremiah. Just tell me the truth about what the Lord says. And Jeremiah says, well, are you going to kill me for it? Uh, because I've told you before, and I've given you counsel before, and you've never listened to it. And so Zedekiah promised that he would not kill him, whatever he said. So Jeremiah again tells him, surrender to Babylon. It's the only way to save your life, your family's life, to save the city, to save everything. The only way to save it is to surrender to to Babylon. God is in control of Babylon, and that's what he says to do. But if you don't, then you won't escape. Your family will not escape. Jerusalem will not escape. Jerusalem and the temple will be destroyed and burned. So Jeremiah, of course, the king did not obey that. Jeremiah, it says, remained in the courtyard of the guard until the day that Jerusalem fell. And then in chapter 39, um, this it, it tells about the fall of Jerusalem. It says in the ninth year of King Zedekiah, the tenth month of the ninth year, and then until the fourth month of his eleventh year. So for about a year and a half, the city is really under siege. Absolute famine, you know, plagues breaking out, terrible situation. And this is all in, at the very end of Zedekiah's reign. And eventually, of course, Babylon just comes in. The walls are broken down, and Babylon enters the city. Zedekiah and his officials and his family uh, flee by night, but the Babylonians catch up with them. They take him back to Nebuchadnezzar, and he has uh, Zedekiah's two sons and his officials and many of his soldiers killed before his eyes, and then he has Zedekiah's eyes gouged out so that that's the last thing that he ever sees. And, of course, takes Zedekiah back to Babylon to be a captive. Jerusalem is burned. Many, many die by the sword. Remember, God promised that they would buy, die by the sword and by famine and by plague. Many of them did had already died by famine and plague. Many die by the sword. And the only... they. They take the remains of the people captive back to Babylon, except for just the very, very poorest of the poor, and they are left to fend for themselves. Nebuchadnezzar had Jeremiah set free. They actually found him chained uh, in the captives that were being taken back to Babylon, and they set him free, and he told him, you can live wherever you want to. You told the truth. You you told them that if they would surrender to me, that, that they would be okay, and they didn't believe you, and so you're to be set free. So uh, King Nebuchadnezzar put uh, Gedaliah, Gedaliah, uh, yeah, Gedaliah on, uh, as governor over this area and over the, the few people that were left there, and other people were brought in from other areas, other places that they had um, conquered were actually brought in there. And so Jeremiah, and he was placed in uh, Mizpah, and Jeremiah decided that that is where he would go and he would live, that he would stay in his country. And in chapter 41, um, we're going to talk about uh, 
Johanan, the son of uh, Kira today, and he warns Gedaliah that there is a plot to kill him, to assassinate him. Gedaliah says, nah, I don't think so. And sure enough, uh, Ishmael, not Ishmael, the brother of Isaac, that's long after him, but Ishmael uh, and his band of men do come in. They assassinate Gedaliah, many of the soldiers and his officials, and uh, along with many of the Jews even that were there with them. And so um, a large group of Babylonian soldiers led by Johanan uh, defeat Ishmael and his men. Ishmael and a few of his soldiers actually get away. They escape. And then uh, that takes us to chapter 42, where we are today. That's just kind of the history that's taken place between these. And um, the people in the, in the first part of chapter 42, we begin in verse 7 today. In the first part of chapter 42, the people that come to Jeremiah, the remaining Jews there, come to Jeremiah, and they say, pray to God and get word from God. What are we supposed to do? Where should we go? What should we do? And whatever God tells you and whatever you pass along to us, then we will do. We promise that we will do. So Jeremiah goes to the Lord in prayer to get this message from God to give these people the leadership and the guidance that they have asked for. And so that's where we begin in our lesson today in verse 7 of uh, chapter 42. It says, Then ten days later the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. So he called together Johanan, son of, of Kara, and all the army officers who were there with him, and all the people from the least to the greatest. So everyone was brought together here to hear this word from God on what we should do. And he he, he says it in front of uh, all of these leaders. Jo, Johanan has become the leader of the Jews, the leader of the people that are left there. And so everyone is brought together to hear the instruction on what they should do from the Lord. They had just come through, and I'm going to touch on this again, but they had just come through some very traumatic times. They had been taken over by Babylon. They had been in siege. They had been starving. They had been sick, all of these things. And, and they had seen the word of Jeremiah come true. And so they go to Jeremiah and they say, tell us what God says for us to do. And so in verse 9, the word of the Lord has come to Jeremiah. Ten, they waited 10 days for this. And, uh, and so it says, And he said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your petition, says. So crazy times. Absolutely crazy times. Jerusalem is totally destroyed. These people have been left there pretty much to fend for themselves. And the governor's been assassinated. This Joe, Joe uh, Hannon has kind of risen to the leadership role because he tried to save this governor of Babylon and the governor didn't believe him. So he's kind of risen to this, uh, this position of leadership among them. And they've just survived this fight. The few of them that are left have survived this fight that where the governor was assassinated. So times were very fearful. Times were very fearful and very uncertain. And they just said, we need direction from God. And like I said, they had seen Jeremiah's prophecies come true right before their eyes. And so Jeremiah is saying, okay, it's been 10 days, but God has told me what he wants you to do. And then we're going to get this in these next, I don't know, quite a few verses. We're going to get the, if you do this, here's what's going to happen to you. But if you don't, then here's what's going to happen. So the if and the then. So in verse 10, if you stay in this land, I will build you up and not tear you down. I will plant you and not uproot you. I have relented concerning the disaster. I have inflicted. So this big if, if you stay here and if you follow my instruction, here's what I will do for you. You notice if. He's giving them the choice. We always have the choice, but we're always responsible for the choice that we make. And there may be rewards. If you do this, here are the rewards. But if you don't, he's going to outline the the 
the consequences that will take place. So these are absolute opposites of what Jeremiah had delivered to the people before when he kept telling them, you've got to turn around, you've got to repent, you've got to turn back to God, because if you don't, he's going to tear you down, he's going to uproot you, and he's going to bring absolute disaster on you. And here he's saying, I will not tear you down before I will tear you down. I'm going to build you up. If you will stay here, I will not continue to tear you down like I like I promised. I've relented. If you will stay here and be obedient to me, I will build you up. I will plant you, not uproot you. And I will not bring disaster on you. But make this deliberate decision to stay with me. But they feared Babylon. They knew that that the governor of Babylon had been killed in this uprising. They knew that Babylon could come in and just absolutely wipe them out and leave no one alive. That they, So they were afraid of Babylon. So what they don't understand, and we'll see this over and over and over, that God is the one that's in control. It just, it I cannot help but wonder what Judah would have looked like had they stayed there, had they remained there, had they turned back to God because he promises to bless them. These are the poorest of the poor that remain. Everyone else that was anybody at all had been taken back to Babylon. So the poorest of the poor are here. They could have had the land. They could have had the vineyards. God promised that he would bless them. And yet we're going to see that they will not take advantage of that promise. And then verses 11 and 12, he goes on with this. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you now fear. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord, for I am with you and will save you and deliver you from his hands. I will show you compassion so that, <clears throat> excuse me, I will show you compassion so that he will have compassion on you and restore you to your land. So he's going on with this promise of restoration and blessing. They feared Nebuchadnezzar. They feared that he would come in and take revenge on them for the killing of his governor and wipe them out and there would be no survivors. But what they don't understand is that the Babylonians are just God's instruments. They still do not understand that God had promised all of this and that God brought it about. And now he's promising these good things and this same God would bring those about. He says, in addition, I will cause this pagan king to have mercy on you, to have compassion on you. They didn't believe it. But, you know, 70 years later, we're going to see that very thing happen through Cyrus and through Artaxerxes. They send the people back to their land. They send them back with supplies, they even with protection. So it was very possible. So it could have looked much different. And much sooner, it could have looked much different. And these poorest of the poor could have risen to riches, but they didn't trust God. So God's promising that don't be afraid. Just trust me and I'll take care of you. I'm in control. Nebuchadnezzar is not in control, but they do not see that. So there were the promises. If you'll do this, here are all of my promises that I will follow through with you. But the flip side of that, if you don't, in, chapter, in verses 13 and 14, however... If you say, we will not stay in this land, and so disobey the Lord your God. And if you say, no, we will go and live in Egypt, where we will not see war or hear the trumpet or be hungry for bread. He's warning them, if you don't do what God has instructed you to do, these promises that he's made won't be good. So, however, if you don't obey even though they had told Jeremiah and they promised Jeremiah if he would go to the Lord, no matter what he said, they would obey it. God and Jeremiah both know that they're not going to obey that. 
So he's saying, however, if you say that you're not going to stay in this land and you'll disobey God and you decide to go live in Egypt where you think you won't see war, where you think you're going to be free from the sword and where you think you're going to be free from famine and have plenty of bread, you're sadly mistaken because it's not Nebuchadnezzar that you need to worry about. It's a limitless God that can follow you anywhere you go. They had forgotten their history in Egypt. Their ancestors, not that far behind them, had just spent 400 years in captivity in Egypt. And now they're thinking that Egypt would, would be a refuge for them. They had forgotten their history. And they've certainly forgotten the power of their God and that God could follow them anywhere with what he said he would do. So there were the if. If you'll do this, here are the promises. Here's the then in verses 15 and 16. Then hear the word of the Lord, you remnant of, Egypt, of Judah. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. If you are determined to go to East Egypt and you do go and settle there, then the sword you fear will overtake you there, and the famine you dread will follow you into Egypt, and there you will die. So he's speaking to this small remnant of Judah. Many of them have been killed by the sword. Many of them have died of plague. Many of them have died of starvation. And he said, if you do not take advantages, advantage of the promises that God has given you and stay here, in this land that he's given you, then here is going to be the consequence. The sword that you fear will follow you to Egypt. The famine that you fear will follow you to Egypt and you will die there. So, you know, God uses the least likely to carry out. I mean, he chose, you know, a man who didn't speak well in Moses to carry out, you know, setting the people free from Egypt. He chose Rahab, a harlot, to make way for the spies. She did, he, he chooses the least likely people so that when we look on it, we go, oh, that was so God. That was so God. And sometimes his plans don't seem like the best plans to us. Sometimes they seem like the least likely option for us to take but he wants us to act by faith. And he will be faithful to the promises that he makes us, but he will also be faithful to the consequences that he promises us if we're not faithful. In verse 17, <clears throat> Indeed, all who are determined to go to Egypt to settle there will die by the sword, famine, and plague. Not one of them will survive or escape the disaster I will bring on them. God is in control. These were the same devastations that God had promised when they didn't return to him, when he was warning them for 40 years through Jeremiah, I'm going to bring this disaster on you. I'm going to bring the sword. I'm going to bring famine. I'm going to bring plague. Babylon is going to take you over. I will use Babylon to discipline you. These same things that he pronounced on this unfaithful, wicked Judah, he said, will happen if you go to Egypt. I will follow you there, and I am still in control. They will still come true. God's word always comes true. Jeremiah's prophecy had come true word for word. The people had seen it, but they just couldn't make themselves be faithful to God and follow his word. It just didn't sound like the right option to them. So in verse 18, the people still see Nebuchadnezzar as their threat instead of God. Verse 18, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, as my anger and wrath have been poured out on those who lived in Jerusalem, so will my wrath be poured out on you when you go to Egypt. You will be a curse and an object of horror. You will be an object of reproach. You will never see this place again. 
These people had witnessed everything that Jeremiah had proclaimed come true, but they were still crediting it to Babylon instead of to God. They wouldn't, why wouldn't you at this point? We, we see it in hindsight. Why at this point can you not see that it's God, that it's, that it's not Nebuchadnezzar, that God promised these things would happen and he used Nebuchadnezzar to do it. But they just cannot do that. They're weighing their choices. They're weighing their fear of Nebuchadnezzar and their fear of God. And at this point, they fear Nebuchadnezzar. They're not fearing God. In verses 19 and 20, this is Jeremiah. He's finished speaking for the Lord, and now he's, he's turning to the people and he's saying, Remnant of Judah, the Lord has told you, do not go to Egypt. Be sure of this. I warn you today that you made a fatal mistake when you sent me to the Lord your God and said, pray to the Lord your God and tell us everything he says and we will do it. You made a fatal mistake when you did that because now he has told you and he's told you, if you do this, then I'm going to bless you. But if you don't, I'm going to curse you. I am going to destroy you. If you choose to rebel against God, it is a fatal mistake. It was a fatal mistake to them then, and it's a fatal mistake to us today. He says, you will never return to your land. You sent me to God, and I went before God, and now you have an answer, and you promised that you would obey that answer. And woe to you if you don't. And then our last two verses, verses 21 and 22. I have told you today, but you still have not obeyed the Lord your God in all he sent me to tell you. So now be sure of this. You will die by the sword, famine and plague in the place where you want to go and settle. Here's the conclusion, folks. I told you sent me to God. I went to him for you. He gave me a clear message for you and you're determined to reject it. So here's the conclusion, and I want you to fully understand the consequence of what you're about to do. Be sure of this, you will die by the sword, famine and plague in the place where you are about to go and settle. Make no mistake of this verdict. This is what God has said, and it is disastrous for you if you disobey him and do not follow him. So what do we learn from this lesson today? Failure to follow God's leadership shows our true heart. Are we depending on our own judgment or are we depending on God's judgment? And we do it just as much as they did. We say, tell us what you want us to do, God. Give us instruction, give us direction. Just tell us what you want us to do. And then we say, oh, that? Oh, well, I don't, I just don't think that that's the best thing for me to do right now. I don't think that's the best choice for me. We do the exact same thing that they did. Oh, that God, oh, that can't be what you're trying to tell me. Sometimes I think that God gives us little tests along the way and just to see if we'll follow what he tells us to do. And then when the big things come, we've, we're like the butterfly. We've built up our strength. We've built up our, our experience with God, and we've followed him, and it, and it worked out to our advantage. Following God is always the right choice, even when it seems wrong to man, even when it seems totally against our reasoning. Following God is the right thing to do. Who is the author of fear? They were afraid. They were more afraid of Nebuchadnezzar than they were of God. That's how far from God they had gotten. Who is the author of fear? But Satan himself. God is the author, not of fear, but of faith and of a sound mind. He's the author of courage and hope. God is always faithful. Satan is always the liar. Fear is a liar. I love that song. Fear is a liar. But God is faithful. He's faithful in his promises to bless us but he is equally as faithful 
and is discipline when we are disobedient. Why? Why can't we look around and see God's faithfulness and be faithful to him regardless of how it appears to us? Because God is trustworthy. He is faithful.